Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. If you have been following along in recent episodes, you know that I am building an R package in order to help me to learn how to make R packages. Uh, this is something that my lab is starting to do more of, uh, trying to make packages in R so that people can use um, all the great things we've been talking about over the history of Code Club uh, to better analyze microbial ecology data and other types of data. Anyway, I had to pick something to make a package for. Uh, and so what I picked was a algorithm called a naive Bayesian classifier. And so again, even if you don't care about what the actual application is, like you, that doesn't just make you excited, like it makes me excited. <laughs> I think you'll get a lot out of this series of episodes, specifically um, how to build a package and kind of some of the differences between taking a data analysis approach to writing R versus uh, doing a programmatic type of approach like we are when we're making a package. As I go through, I try to articulate some of the different design considerations and coding considerations that come to mind as I'm trying to build this out. In the last episode, we talked about taking a DNA sequence of ATs, Gs, Cs, and sometimes Ns, and converting that to base three, so zero, one, two, three. And that what that allows us to do is that when we pull out a KMER, say a, a eight, a number sequence uh, or a string that's got eight numbers in it, that being an eight mer, which is the default KMER size for this algorithm, we can take that base four eight mer and actually convert it to an integer that's base 10. What that allows us to do is that allows us then to directly index into a vector or a matrix to the exact spot we want very efficiently. Alternatively, if we had kept things in kind of the, the character space, ATs, Gs, and Cs, then we know that there'd be like 65,000 plus possible 8 mers. And so if I had an 8 mer that I needed to look up, well, every time I go to look it up, it's like going through a phone book trying to find someone's name, right? That can be pretty tedious and pretty time consuming. Versus if I told you to jump ahead 253 pages, bam, you'd get there instantly, right? So that's what we're trying to go for. Well, in today's episode, <laughs> that's a long-winded way of saying for today's episode, what we're gonna do is build upon that to then build a vector for each sequence that tells us whether or not that specific KMER was present in our sequence. Then with that vector for an individual sequence, we'll then build it out for all of the sequences in our database. And from that then, we will then go and calculate the total number of sequences in each genus that have a specific KMER. That will allow us to calculate the word-specific priors and the genus-specific conditional probabilities. The word-specific priors were described in this paragraph within the methods section of uh, this wonderful paper. It's here on page two in the first column, if you like the, the analog version of the paper, like I do. Anyway, the expected likelihood estimate for determining the Jeffrey Perks law of succession, whatever that is, determined by the formula, PI equals NWI plus 0.5 divided by big N plus one. Basically what this means is that if we take all of the sequences in our data set, we can count how many sequences have each KMER. So that WI, we can think of as being all possible eight character subsequences or those words. NWI is the number of sequences that have that. We're only counting uh, occurrence one time per sequence. So if a sequence has say nine, a stretch of nine A's in a row, well then it's gonna have that eight mer of all A's twice, right? So we're only gonna count that once though. So we're gonna count the number of sequences that have a given KMER, add a half, and then divide by the total number of sequences plus one. That half and that one, what it's doing is say we have a KMER that is really rare and say it doesn't actually show up in any of our sequences. Well, we don't want the probability to be zero. <laughs> Instead, we want it to be a really small number. So in that case, the NWI would be zero and we'd get 0.5 divided by a big number, which is again, a small probability. With this word specific prior, we'll then be able to calculate the genus specific conditional probabilities. And this is the probability that a member of a genus contains a specific word. And so in the algorithm that was calculated or estimated, by this formula. Again, it's the same idea, except M, instead of looking across all sequences, is looking within a specific genus to see in that genus, say like Escherichia or Pseudomonas, how many sequences have a specific KMER. And then we're gonna add the PI, which we saw uh, in the previous slide for those, those priors, 
divided by the number of sequences in the genus plus one. So this PWI given G then will allow us to then calculate the probability of seeing a sequence from a specific genus as we see down here in this last sentence. Again, in the last couple of episodes, we've talked about collecting those eight nucleotide words. What we're going to do now is to move on in this reference column to calculate the PI, the, the prior for each word, and then to calculate that conditional probability for each word given a genus, for each genus and word. So that's what we have to do today, and we'll head over to RStudio and get going on that now. I already have my kmers.r and testkmers.r scripts open up. Uh, you'll notice I'm putting everything into these two files at some point, but not today. <laughs> we're we're going to have to kind of take a step back and perhaps do a better job of organizing this because we don't want to have a package with one R script. That's probably not ideal. And of course, we are still at kind of the early stages of developing this package. Anyway, we'll worry about that later. So I'm going to come down and create a new test. So I'll do test that. So the first thing I want to work on today is accurately detecting each kmer for a given sequence. So I'll go ahead and do accurately detect uh, kmers from a sequence. All right. And then again, hopefully we're getting used to this syntax for our test of that statements. So I'll go ahead and grab this sequence because it's already um, converted to base four. And so I'll call this sequence. So from this sequence, I'm going to get all possible kmers. I'm going to use the function that I've already written and tested. So I'll do get all kmers on the sequence. And again, if I uh, load everything here, and I can load things quickly by doing shift command L, um, and I can do shift command T to test. These are two uh, keystrokes that I have started to use to allow me to do the loading and testing all the easier. So this will give us our sequence and then all possible possible kmers. I'll go ahead and call this my kmers, and then I'll have my indices, which will be uh, base four to index on my kmers, right? Um, and that's not happy, oh, because I haven't run this line. All right, so now I have my indices, right? And those are those indices, cool. And so again, if I think about what I wanna do here, is I wanna get a vector for this sequence. So I'll call this detected, and my function is going to be detect uh, kmers on sequence, right? And so this detected will be a vector uh, that is four to the eight. So that's four to the eight units long. So 65,536 elements that detected will have, right? And so what I expect then is that if I sum up the values of detected, again, those should be zeros and ones, that I should get the, the sum of those ones should equal the length of indices, right? And especially if I take detected and index in indices, right? So if I take detected and then put in indices, this will return a vector with only those values, right? And so I could then say something like the length of this, right? Uh, and, and I can do expect uh, equal length of that. And then the expected would be length of indices. And another test I might do would be expect equal. Uh, like I said, we could also kind of invert that. So we could do length. Um, actually, let me let me actually copy this down and I'm going to invert it. So everything that's not an in index uh, will show up and then I'll have a length of that. So I could also then say like four to the eight minus the length of indices which would tell me everything that wasn't detected, right? So this is looking at what's detected. This is looking at what's not detected. I think I'll add another test uh, based on this one where instead of length, I'll do sum, right? And so uh, if these values are all ones, then summing them up should be the same as the length of the indices, okay? So these are kind of three tests that I wanna check out and go ahead and run the tests on that and find sure enough that it fails. Uh, it runs the first test and then bails out when it fails. So it's having a problem because it can't detect kmers. I'll go ahead now and create that function. So over here, I'll do detect kmers and I'll do sequence. And I also want the default kmer size. So I'll do kmer size uh, by default will be eight. So again, I'm giving it the sequence. I'm not giving it the kmers, right? And so basically what I want then is this stuff, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and copy these two lines. And so this is 
maybe cheating a little bit <laughs> because I'm writing my code in my test, but I understand that there's some people that do test-driven development just that way. They write the test and get it to pass, and then they copy that code over into their function. So um, maybe along the way, we'll make another test that's kind of independent of this code that I've written. All right, so again, we have k-mers and indices, and now I need a vector that uh, is the total length of the number of k-mers, right? And k-mers, and I'll say four to the uh, k-mer size, right? And again, in the future, we might do seven, six, nine, ten. Who knows? We'd like to have that flexibility in the k-mer size. Um, and again, I need for for my development purposes here, I need to go ahead and load that in. And again, what we've seen before is that n k-mers should be about sixty-five thousand, and so that's good, <laughs> right? So to create a vector, I could do numeric on n k-mers. So this then gives me that vector with 65,536 entries. It only shows me the first thousand and kind of quickly scanning through these, we see that they're all zero, right? And so what I'd like to do then is I will call this my uh, kmers detected. And I can then do kmers detected. And I can then index into that my indices and say that equals one. So I'll go ahead and save that and let's test. So this is failing. Um, and I think I know what is wrong. Um, it's returning, it seems to be passing the first test for some reason, um, right? So it seems to be passing this. Uh, I'm not really sure why. Um, so, but it's failing the second and third test. I think the problem is that I'm not returning uh, number of kmers detected. So I'll do return kmers detected. And so our functions return the last calculated value. And so I think here it's returning one <laughs> rather than kmers detected. So I think it's good to always be explicit. You'll see up here, I've got a function or a couple functions where I don't return, I have a return statement. And I think in these cases, it's more obvious because the output of the pipeline is the value. So let's go ahead, save this and test and see what happens. So that all passed, so that is a good sign. So I wanna go ahead and rerun these tests, but what I'm gonna do is add a n to the end of the sequence. Then everything else here should produce the same result, right? Because that n, that last eight mer will generate an na value, and then it will, um, what? It should kick it out when we do the get all k-mers, right? And so all these values then should be the same because we're, we're adding a nucleotide basically to everything. Sure enough, that works. Um, something that occurs to me though is that this is all kind of hardwired for eight mers, right? So I do get all k-mers, but I'm not giving it the k-mer size. So the default there is eight as well. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and add another test. And here then I will do, um, let's get all k-mers and let's do k-mer size equals seven, and we'll have to add that elsewhere. So we'll do that here for detected, um, and then here this should be a seven. So let's go ahead, save and test. That fails, good. <laughs> and so here I need to go ahead and add in camera size um, as, so that's good. So I think that's the only place. So let's go ahead and test that, and it all passes, wonderful. So now we've taken a sequence, We've converted to base four, we've extracted all of the n mers, how our k mers, however big that k is, and then we've converted that from base four to base 10. And now we have returned a vector that with each cell representing the individual k mer um, and indicated whether or not that k mer exists, okay? So now what we wanna do is do that across all of our sequences. So now I'm gonna do another test. So we'll do test that, and then we'll say, accurately detect kmers across multiple sequences. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy the sequence that I have been working with here. But to keep things simple, I'm gonna go ahead and shorten it, maybe cut it about in half there. And I'm gonna make this a vector of values. And instead of putting a zero or an A at the end of that sequence, I'm gonna make it a, um, a C, <laughs> right? And so it's kind of hard for me to think in this base three instead of nucleotides. Anyway, so we'll have that. And again, to keep things simple, I'll do kmer size of um, three because with eight, we're gonna get a 
um, a matrix or a vector that's got these like 65,536 rows versus if we do three, then we'll have 64 rows. So I'm expecting to get out of this function that I'm gonna write as a matrix. So we'll do matrix and we're gonna have, I'm gonna seed it with zeros and I'm gonna expect it to have n row equals four to the kmer size and n call equals two because I have two sequences, right? So I'll call this expected. And so then my expected, the rows, I'm gonna use my functions to build out those indice values, right? So this is gonna get a little bit uh, funky in here, but roll with me here. So we'll do get all uh, kmers on sequence uh, one, and we'll we'll do um, size kmer size, right? Uh, so that will give us what? Well, I guess I need to load this and this, and then here, this will give us those values. And so then I need to shift these to base 10. So then we'll do base four to um, index on that. And so let's double check that this all works. Cool. And then those are gonna be equal to one. And then I'll copy this. And the only thing we'll have to change is sequence two, right? And so now if we look at expected, oh, we're gonna expect 64 rows and two columns. Sure enough, that's what we get. And we can see uh, that something didn't work quite right, um, that this column two is empty. So that's not a good sign. Ah, and I see the problem here is that I'm putting it into the row, but I'm not telling it what column. So this needs to be in column one, and this needs to be column two. And so now if we look at expected, I think this should look better. Sure enough, everything looks good. There should be one kmer, right? These are off by one, right? Because I changed that last kmer value. So that all looks good. Now we'll do detect kmers across all sequences, right? And then we'll give that uh, sequence, right? I guess I could have called that sequences, but whatever. And so then I'll call this my um, detect matrix, then I expect equal expected and detect matrix. And I misspelled equal here. And again, if we test this, it's going to fail because it doesn't know this function. This function name is, is kind of long. Maybe I'll remove the all to, because the sequences will say kind of the all, right? So we'll go ahead and call this the function. And then we'll come back over here and we'll do that function sequences, and then kmer size by default, again, we'll make eight, create our body here. So I could imagine doing something like detect kmers uh, sequences one uh, with kmer size, All right? So if I go ahead and load everything, um, and then I run this, uh, sequence is not found, so, uh, Let's see. So I call this sequence sequences. I'll update all these sequences. All right. Okay. So I think that'll work. So again, if we load sequences, now it's loaded. And now we do detect cameras on that. This is one value, right? And so basically what we did back out in the testing script was something like this, right? And so we could imagine looping over all possible sequences. And so you could do this with a for loop but there's a better way. <laughs> and so we'll do that with S apply. So we'll do S apply. So do sequences. So for each value of sequences, we're going to put that through detect kmers. And so we run that and we get uh, what looks like a matrix, right? Uh, and so we get a whole bunch of those rows back. And actually, uh, it's by default using eight, which is why there's so many values here, right? So again, to test this, I'll do kmer size of three. And so it's returning a matrix like it's got 65,000 rows, right? But all of my kmers are in the first 64, I believe, right? And so the problem there, actually, I don't know where they're going. Anyway, um, is that my S apply isn't using the kmer size. So I'll go ahead and do kmer size equals kmer size, and that will then pass the kmer size argument into detect kmers. Now when I run this, yes, I get 64 rows, and I get something that looks kind of like 
I would expect it to look. Um, so let's go ahead and save and um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, comment this out for now so that it doesn't get run with my test. I'll go ahead and test it. I'm getting an error, but I think I'm getting confused and trying to understand this error because I have my, my values flipped here in the expect equal. Um, it wants the expected in the second spot, not the first spot. So let's go ahead and rerun this and see if the errors make any more sense. So come back up here again, we're failing. And so the actual has 65,000 rows. The expected has 64 rows. Um, and so again, why is that happening? Ah, and so the output of my function here is 65,000 rows, right? Uh, and that's because I'm not giving it the camera size. So I'll do camera size. Let's save that and test it again. So it's failing now because the dimension names um, is a list. And um, again, if we look at the output from this, that we find that we've got column names, right? Whereas there were no column names on our matrix. And so there's an argument we can give s apply, which is use.names equals false. And again, if we run that now, we see that those column names are gone. Let's go ahead, save and test, and hopefully it'll pass. Sure enough, that passes, that did the trick. So now we have the ability to generate a matrix where our rows are our index values for our k-mers and our columns are the different sequences. The next thing we need to get are those prior probabilities for each word. And so to do that, we're gonna have to sum across each of our k-mers and then add uh, 0.5 and divide it by one plus the total number of sequences in our collection. So we'll go ahead and create another test. So I'll do test that. And then we'll do um, calculate word specific uh, priors. All right. And so we'll go ahead and take, uh, let's go ahead and take these again. And I'm gonna add a third sequence, right? And it's going to be the same as the second sequence because I wanna make sure that there's some uh, redundancy and some difference in the different k-mers that are found. And so now I'm gonna, again, do detect matrix and we'll, I'll go ahead and just copy this down, right? And again, if I do k-mers size three and then detect matrix. So I'm gonna pick a few rows from this that I'm gonna be most interested in. And so I'll do 26, 29, and 30. Right, so 26, um, all three, uh, 29, only one, and then 30, only uh, two and three, okay? I don't know why I wrote out three. Anyway, so kind of the math that we can think about with detect matrix is that we wanna sum across the columns, right? And so an easy way to do that with base R is apply. So this is like S apply, but apply. <laughs> and so it takes a matrix or data frame and then a dimension that you want to operate across. So one is rows and two is columns. So if I do one comma sum, it will then run a sum across each row of the data matrix. And so here we go, we see all that. If I had made this two, uh, then I should get three values, six, six, and six, that's ominous. Uh, let's go ahead and stick with one where we again have 64 values. And so then I can go ahead, that is the k-mer count. And again, I will add then 0 0.5, that adds 0 0.5 to each value. And then I will make that the numerator and divide by one plus the number of sequences. So I'll do length sequences. And then this gives me my word specific priors, right? And so this is my expected, right? I'll then create a value that I'll call priors. And this will be then uh, calc word specific priors. And I'm thinking, do I wanna give it the sequences or the detect matrix? I think I wanna give it the detect matrix because I think with a large number of reference sequences, detect matrix is actually gonna take a bit of time to generate. And so I don't wanna to have to regenerate detect matrix multiple times for the priors as well as for the conditional probabilities. So instead, I'm gonna give it the detect matrix. I don't need to give it the k-mer size because that's already baked into the number of rows in the data frame, right? I could manually calculate the values for 26, 29, and 30, right? So it's an all three, that's gonna be three plus 0 0.5, 
divided by one plus three, right? And so that is gonna be something. Maybe I'll wrap this in parentheses so I can copy and paste it into my console, right? And so this is 0.875, right? And then if I repeat this, but for one of the values, it's gonna be 0.375. And then for two and three, um, so two, um, it's gonna be 0.625. And then if I also do like, um, I think 64 was all zeros. So if I do 64, none, uh, then that's gonna be like uh, zero plus 0 0.5, right? And that's gonna be 0 0.125. All right, and so again, we can then do expect equal and again i could do expect equal um expected versus priors but again i manually did these and in a way i feel like doing this in the test is a little bit of a, a cheap way around the test and so manually calculating it like this um, i think is a little bit i don't know added benefit so we'll go ahead and do priors um expected right so that would be if i if i use the code i could also do expect equal uh, priors, uh, and then I'll do 26. Um, and I'm going to copy this a few times, four times for 26, 29, 30, and 64. Again, this is probably a bit redundant, but um, you can see a couple different ways of generating the test. Maybe uh, people that ha might have more experience with test driven development can tell me what they think of these two different approaches to testing, whether it's kind of manually calculating things by hand versus writing the code. Um, so we'll go ahead and test this and see what we get. Oh, and I introduced a typo here, let me try that again. So again, this fails <laughs> because I don't have the function. So now we need to go ahead and generate the function, calc word specific priors. All right, and then we're gonna give that our Kamer matrix, right? Which I was calling the detection matrix, all right? And I'll go ahead and copy this code that I wrote back here. So the one thing that I am using here that I don't have access to is sequences. So this should be n call on detect matrix. So now this should pass. And I guess I, uh, yep, my parentheses all look good. Go ahead and test that and should pass. Wonderful. Okay. So this gets us our word specific priors. And now we need to get our conditional probabilities. I'm gonna go ahead and load everything. Um, and so then we'll generate a new test. Test that. Calculate specific conditional probabilities. And I'm gonna borrow some of this from up here. Right, so I've got my Kamer size, my sequences, and my detection matrix. The other thing I'm gonna to need to give it are my genera. And so I'm gonna uh, just call this A, B, and B. And I think that should work well. So again, these two sequences are different from this sequence, and so they go into a different genus. Again, this is all kind of test code uh, and, and something simple so that we can kind of manually uh, work through the, the calculations to make sure that what we're doing with the code actually generates the right values. So I'll go ahead and run these lines so I have it all loaded. So again, the calculation, so we'll have MWI, which is the count within the genus, plus PI, which is the prior, right? So that added together divided by M plus one, where M is the total number of sequences in the genus. So I'm gonna get the priors. And so again, my function here was, or I'll go ahead and just copy this line and I get my priors, right? Good. And uh, the interesting <laughs> uh, values are up here. Uh, and maybe I'll go ahead and copy this whole thing. All right, copy that down. I don't need this just yet. Um, and so again, if I have um, two genera and I'm using MWI, then let's see. So 26 is in all three. And so the I'm gonna have a two and a one, right? So I'll have 
genus A has, has the kamer in one sequence and genus B has it in two sequences, right? And so then I also have the M, which is going to be um, 1, 2, right? And so one of the nice things about R being what's called vectorized is that I can do something like this, right? So that's going to add a half to 1 and 2, and then it's going to add, um, well, I don't want it to add 3. I want it to add 1, right? And so then this is going to add 1 to 1 and 2, and then I can get the ratio, which will be uh, 0.75 and uh, 0.833, okay? Cool. And uh, for only one having it, so only A has uh, Kamer 29, then again, I can think about this formula the same way. And so only one has it, um, and so here this is going to be 0, right? And so that should work. Right? And that gives us this. And then only 2 and 3 having it will be, again, copying this code down. Um, it's going to be only B having it, so it's going to be 0 and 2. And again, if we run that, we get 0.25 and 0.833. Very good. So again, these are going to be my expected values. And so this last one that doesn't have it at all in either of the genera, We'll do this, so it'll be 0 and 0. Again, these values and the denominator, the m values, are staying at 1 and 2 because that's how many sequences we have in the genus. So that doesn't change. And so that gets us 0.25 and 0.166666, which makes sense compared to the two previous cases, right? So this was what we got when it was absent from A, and this is what we got when it was absent from B. Cool. So these are our test values. And so I can go ahead and I think copy this code directly in here for my expected values. And I'll do that here real quick. All right, and then I'm going to have, I'll remove that and I'll do my conditional uh, prob. So I'll call this calc genus conditional prob and I will then give that detect matrix okay and again if we test this it's going to fail oh it doesn't fail or it does fail because I can't find this function but I didn't put this in here uh, and so I need to modify this actually too uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and put a comma here uh, and so this will be row 26 both columns and so Again, it's going to fail as it says here because we couldn't find the function. Uh, so we'll go ahead and grab that and come over here. Function detect matrix. And I think the other thing I need to give it is the word specific prior, right? And so we'll go ahead and give it that. And here we'll also give it the word specific priors. Maybe I'll put this down a line so we can see everything without having to score left and right. All right, and do the same thing here. Cool, all right. And so again, what we're thinking about, um, so another piece of information I realize we need are the genera, right? And because we're gonna need to know how to aggregate the columns of detect matrix. So there's a few pieces of information that I need to get from these three values. I'm going to need to get, um, well, really one main thing. I'm going to need to get the total number of sequences in each genus. And I'm going to also need to aggregate the values, the columns and detect matrix by their genus, right? And so I can start with like table genera. And um, this gives me A and B. But it's, it's a weird data structure that I don't quite understand why it does this, um, that it's a table format and it's got dimension names. I'd rather it to be a vector. And so what I could perhaps do is send this to as.vector, and that returns it as a vector. And so I will then do genus counts. And so now I know I have two genera, right? And so the output of my conditional probabilities, so I'll do genus 
conditional prob. I'll do matrix and I'll give everything a value of zero initially. And my n row, it'll be the number of row on the detect matrix. And the number of columns will be genus uh, counts, actually not genus counts, length of genus counts. Um, I could have for n row also used um, length of, uh, well, word specific priors, not calc word specific priors. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm probably trying to go a little too fast here. So this is priors, right? Okay. And so this is initializing my matrix. And again, if we look at this, we see that we've got two columns, right, for each of the two genera. And we then have our 64 rows for the different possible k-mers. And so what we want to do next is to aggregate the values in detect matrix to aggregate and calculate the number of sequences in each genus that had a k-mer. And so I'm going to use a for loop. So for loops get a bad rap in R. Generally, for loops are a problem if you are growing a vector or growing a matrix. They're also a problem if you have nested for loops. So if you have a for loop within a for loop, those are bad. So what we're going to do here instead is that we've already created the matrix, right? And so we're not going to have to expand the matrix. And so when you expand the matrix, it goes really slow because it's constantly looking for new places to put the new matrix that you've created. And so I'll do for i in uh, one colon uh, length uh, genus counts. I'm going to go ahead and call this uh, n genera on length uh, yeah, length genus counts. And because I'm using this a couple times, so I'll go ahead and plop that in there. And then here. All right. And so we're going to we're going to index over our detect matrix, right? So we'll do detect matrix. So I'm sitting here realizing that my genera is coming in as a string rather than as an integer. And so this again is the same type of problem that we had with our sequences. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, recast these as integers, right? Um, and we'll have to figure out something later where we, when we're reading in the genera, we can convert it to a number. And so this needs to be an integer, not a character, okay? And so, and so then genus counts. If I look at genus counts, one and two are the values in one and two, right? The number of times we see each of those. Okay. And so then let's see, uh, that all works. Okay. So we're going to then de use detect matrix, uh, all the rows and the ith column. I am going to add that to, um, let's see. Um, maybe before I call it genus conditional prob, I'll call it genus count. Okay. And so then we'll add that to genus count um, on all rows. And then I is going to be indexed into genera to figure out what genus it is, right? So we'll do genera I. So if I is two, then genera I will be two, right? Um, if I is three, then genera I is going to be two, right? And so we're going to then be adding this to the existing value of this, but we need to assign it back to this, right? Okay. So that then should get us our genus counts. And so um, let's clean this up a little bit. And now if we look at genus count, let's see what we've got here. So we've got our 64 rows and it's not quite doing what I had anticipated. Um, we're basically getting out the detection, not the genus count. And so I see the problem that I'm indexing over the genera, not the number of sequences, right? And so n sequences is going to be length gen genera. All right. So sometimes these things get a little bit confusing. Um, and so I'll go ahead and plop that in there 
and let's go ahead and start this again. And now if I do genus count, again, I have 64 rows and I see sure enough, I've got these with uh, the, the correct number of sequences that had that kamer in that uh, genus. Cool. So now we have genus count and now we need to go ahead and do that conversion um, that I had here, right? To get the conditional probability. And maybe I'll go ahead and throw this up here. Uh, maybe I'll put it up there. At some point, I need to come through and do a better job of documenting my code uh, because at this point, there's really no documentation and that's a really bad example to be setting. So again, we have genus count. We're gonna go ahead and then add the word specific uh, priors, okay? And so again, that's gonna be in the numerator and it doesn't like my word specific priors because uh, word specific priors is the same as prior. It doesn't like prior. Why don't you like priors? Oh, priors. Ah, I didn't hear you correct me on that one. All right, uh, so now if we do this, sure enough, we get the two added to each other, right? All these were like zeros and so 0.125 was the prior for a kamer where it wasn't found in any sequence, right? And here we see uh, those others. And so good. Um, and now we need to divide it by um, m plus one. And so m plus one is gonna be the genus counts plus one, right? And so if we run that, then we get um, some kind of funny results, right? So this 64, I would not expect to be 0 0.41 and 0 0.41, right? I would expect it to perhaps be 0 0.41 and 0 0.6 or something like that. And so one of the challenges with vectorized code <laughs> in R is getting the dimensions right. So this is a 64 row by two column matrix, whereas this is a one row by two column matrix, right? And so we need to go ahead and transpose with the T function, the numerator, right? So now we have two rows and all these columns, and then we can then divide by the vector. And so now we get something that makes a bit more sense, right? And so that's good, but we need to like retranspose it, right? And so then we need to take the whole thing and transpose it. So let's go ahead and save that and let's test it and see if it passes our test. And so it's failing. And I noticed that I did something silly when I was calculating the expected, right? That I have this 0.5 here. And that was part of the formula for the word specific prior. And so I need to modify that to be 0.875 here. And then what did I have up here? 0.375 and then 0.625 and then what? 0.125. All right, test again. And so I'm still getting a fail on my last test and um, it's liking the first value, the first actual unexpected, but not the second. And I believe that is because I left in a two rather than a zero because 64, Kamer 64 isn't found in either of the genera, now it should pass. It passes, wonderful. So I've found using test-driven development to be just really fascinating. What, what ends up happening are, are, I guess, two things worth commenting on, I think, is that I get code that is a lot more concise and in my mind, um, better designed. And that I would probably have made a bunch of these functions all one function. And instead, I feel like the code um, is, is a lot better um, self-documenting and understanding what's going on. The other thing that I find is that as I kind of showed in some of these typos that I introduced by copying and pasting and whatever, is that first of all, I'm prone to making errors myself. And second of all, by kind of going through this, I better understand what the code is trying to do, okay? So um, again, uh, I'd be curious what your experience has been with test-driven development. So far, I really like it. I'm a little bit worried as things are gonna get even more complicated, how we're gonna go about doing test-driven development. But for now, I'm pretty happy with it. And it's, it's comforting to me that we have all these tests um, and they run fairly quickly. So again, in this episode, we did these last two points in the reference column of calculating the prior 
word specific prior as well as the conditional probability for each genus for each word um, and so we'll, we'll see where we go next but hopefully you're enjoying this process of building out this phylotyper r package so please make sure that you've subscribed to the channel and we'll see you next time for another episode of code club